How does a human being become a productive member of society? A human being has to learn a lot more uh, to become a fully mature member of the species than a dog needs to learn or a horse needs to learn. Uh, it takes many, many years before a human being is fully mature. We don't let you drive till you're 16. We don't let you vote till you're 18. We don't let you buy beer until you're 21. What is the process whereby we take uh, little baby humans and turn them into functioning citizens like yourself? Um, there are lots of things that we take for granted that aren't a natural element of humanity. Potty training is not a natural element of humanity, something you've got to learn. Uh, and uh, speaking, writing, being literate, these are not natural elements of humanity. They're things that you have to learn. If you think about it, um, uh, uh, think about a toddler and think about the ways that toddlers behave. People always say, oh, uh, aren't uh, children sweet? Well, I don't know how sweet they are. Uh, if you think about it, toddlers are actually little barbarians. I mean, they defecate whenever they have to. They urinate whenever they feel the urge. Have you ever seen a toddler throw a tantrum? Do you know how quick uh, a toddler is to um, uh, take a swing at you or hit you if uh, it's not pleased? I mean, toddlers are actually little barbarians and it's a good thing they're small because if they were six feet tall they'd be very very dangerous. Now how do you turn these little barbarians uh, into ordinary human beings? Now one of the things that the chapter points out and the video that I've referred you to is what we have called in sociology feral children or children who through isolation or neglect um, have skipped out on this process and these children provide natural experiments for what might happen if you don't go through this process, this process that sociologists call socialization, the process of taking uh, a raw feral toddler and turning him or her into a functioning member of society. Those of you who have taken psychology might be familiar with the theories of Sigmund Freud. And Freud divided the human personality up into several elements. This is an oversimplification, but briefly, uh, Freud argued that everyone possesses something that he calls the id, which are your short-term desires, your urges, your wants. These are uh, things that you desire and your id is constantly wanting satisfaction. Give me, give me, give me, give me. And the id comes from your biology. Think about your biological mandates that you want to satisfy. You know anybody who might be grumpy when they're hungry? Do you know anybody who might be loopy when they're tired? These are ways that your biology um, tells you that it has needs and that they want to be met. But sometimes uh, you can't eat when you want to eat or you can't sleep when you want to sleep or you can't go to the bathroom when you want to go to the bathroom. You have to hold it. And so, uh, uh, the, I mean, imagine what the world would be like if everyone was all id all the time, right? It would be complete chaos. And so, there has to be some sort of way of helping people learn that these urges and desires need to be reined in, that they uh, should be um, uh, satisfied at the appropriate time. And this is the process of putting the culture uh, that is out there within your head. This is the process of teaching you to learn uh, that there are certain uh, uh, long-term needs and that there is a certain sense of responsibility um, that you uh, have to establish. And Freud called this the super ego. Uh, super uh, means above. Ego means, you know, I the self, above the self. So this is what you get from culture. So biology is telling you me, 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 and culture is telling you 
Now, hang on a second. Uh, we have to be civilized here. Um, and uh, the ego or the sense of self is the balancing act between these biological mandates and these cultural expectations. I think the first clash between the id and the superego is potty training, where you are attempting to teach a young boy or girl that it is necessary for him or her to hold bodily functions until an appropriate time or an appropriate place. You are teaching a child that he or she must overrule biology. And that's really the first time. Uh, and that's uh, one reason why potty training is often fraught with difficulty. Uh, I've potty trained two children and uh, there are some adventures that are involved. Uh, I remember watching my mother teach my little sister to eat with a fork. Uh, babies just like to grab their food and shove it in their mouth. It's the most efficient way. If you've ever seen a baby eat spaghetti, uh, it's hilarious to watch, but it wouldn't really be very fun to go to an Italian restaurant and see all of the patrons eating their spaghetti this way. People have to learn to use, uh, in this culture, a fork in China, chopsticks, whatever. Um, and I remember my mom putting the fork in my little sister's hand and her throwing it across the room and throwing it a, tan a tantrum because she wanted to eat the way she had always eaten. But it is necessary for parents and other agents of socialization to press people to learn, to conform to social expectations, and to circumscribe their biological urges. Now, how do you get the superego established in the first place? How does the learning process work? Why does it take hold? And for this, we turn to the sociologist George Herbert Mead. And Mead said that the process of socialization was done primarily through interaction with primary others, what he called primary others, which, you know, in our culture is essentially mom, mom and dad, but more mom, more mom than dad in our culture. Uh, is the primary agent of socialization. And uh, it's pretty simple how it works uh, from the standpoint of a toddler or a baby, <clears throat> right? So mom provides me a lot of positive reinforcement. And I like that positive reinforcement. And mom has certain expectations of me. And when I meet these expectations, I get the positive reinforcement that I like. And this makes me feel happy. And when I don't meet these expectations, I don't get the positive reinforcement that I like. And I might even get some negative things. And uh, this makes me feel sad. Okay, so that's just classic conditioning. And your dog understands that, right? Your dog uh knows that you have expectations and your dog knows that there will either be uh, rewards or uh, punishments if it doesn't behave but uh, here is something that's different this is where humans are different a human can learn what mom expects and in addition to knowing what mom expects you can sort of learn how mom thinks. You can sort of understand how mom's mind works. You can get a handle on the way mom approaches various situations in such a way that you can kind of predict what she's going to do. Now, if I know what mom thinks, then it stands to reason that she knows what I think. I can predict what she's going to do, and it seems to me that she can predict what I'm going to do. So I know mom's mind, and it appears that mom knows my mind. And this presents the idea to children for the first time that minds exist independently of bodies. I can imagine what's in mom's mind when mom's not even present. I can imagine how mom will react to certain situations even when she's not around. And 
uh, one of the ways that I can discern mom's personality or mom's mind is by looking at expressions. Now, my expressions reflect my feelings. When I'm happy, I smile or laugh. When I'm sad, I frown or cry. And I know that these expressions are tied to these emotions. Now, inter interestingly enough, I see these expressions in mom. And because I know that these expressions reflect my feelings, I can assume that these expressions also reflect her feelings. And this is what psychologists call the theory of mind or the idea that you have minds that exist independent of, bo of bodies and that you can discern the properties of other people's minds and you can understand that other people can discern the properties of your mind. And this is uh, you have a uh, you know this is built into your brain uh, evolutionary psychologists say that the ability to discern the emotions of other people from their expressions is hardwired biologically into your brain as a matter of fact uh, this module even works on inanimate objects you can look at inanimate objects that appear to have faces and you can discern uh, their emotions. Let me give you some examples. You, these are not faces, but your brain can't help but see faces. And your brain can't help but ascribe emotional states or personalities or feelings to those faces, right? Look, the razor is worried. Uh, the uh, mop is grumpy. The washer uh, is nauseous. And, and if you can do that with a mop and a washer, think how quickly you can discern the mental state of another person just by looking at that person's face. Now, uh, the last step from discerning emotions, like uh, an angry pickle or a pissed off onion or uh, a, a red pepper that is having a bad day, uh, in addition to discerning um, the emotional state, you can also end up feeling what the person feels. And that is the development of empathy. I know what it feels like to be angry. And so uh, when I see my mom angry, I can empathize with that. I know what it feels like to be sad. And so when I see that my mom is sad, I can empathize with that. And this is what Mead calls role taking, the ability to put yourself in another's shoes and not only know what they're thinking or presume what they're thinking, but to feel what they're feeling. And that is the essence of morality, being able to feel what someone else is, what someone else can feel. I mean, Think of the difference between, um, uh, well, let me give you an example. Uh, here are two married men who will never cheat on their wife. Married man number one says, I will never cheat on my wife. And you know why? Because you never know when you're going to get caught. I mean, you can be as sneaky as you want to be, but you know, something could always happen and you get found out. I mean, I just wouldn't do it because you never know when you're going to get caught. The other person could tell, have a change of heart. You could leave behind a clue. I just wouldn't do it. Whereas person B says something like, I would never cheat on my wife because if my wife cheated on me, it would kill me. And if I cheated on my wife, the guilt would be so awful that I would have to confess anyway 
because I wouldn't be able to live with myself. Do you see the difference between rationally knowing that something is wrong and having a conscience that won't allow you to hurt another person because by hurting another person, you hurt yourself. That is what proper socialization is all about, right? At first, I don't hit my baby brother. If I'm, you know, if I'm four years old and I have a baby brother, at first I don't hit him because when I do hit him, I get in trouble and mom yells at me. But later I learn that I don't hit my brother because I know what it feels like to be hit and um, I don't like it, right? That's empathy. Mead says, at first, we can feel empathy only with primary others, only with uh, our mom and dad and the people that we're close to. But later, he says, we can feel empathy for generalized others. We feel empathy for anybody. Right? I feel empathy for students that come into my office. A doctor feels empathy for his or her patients. You feel empathy for a stranger. Right? And that is how society hangs together morally because properly socialized people don't want to hurt other people because if they hurt other people, they hurt themselves, right? And we have um, a word for a person who has no empathy. What do we call a person who has no empathy, right? A psychopath. A psychopath is a person who intellectually knows right from wrong, but doesn't have any sense of uh, guilt. People who are autistic often have uh, problems reading other people's emotions and they have difficulty with empathy. For people who uh, are not autistic and who are not psychopaths, the ability to feel empathy seems to be a function of evolution. We have evolved to have a sense of empathy, but uh, even though it exists in our biology, the social part has to be there as well. It won't happen by itself. It has to, the, the teaching of it has to unfold with the biological development. It's kind of like language. Uh, my wife is a native Spanish speaker and I'm a native English speaker. And so in our house, my wife only speaks Spanish and I only speak English. And because of that, our children have two native languages. They speak Spanish without an accent. They speak English without an accent. They have two native languages. Now, when I speak Spanish, I have a horrible accent. Uh, I'm barely comprehensible. And when my wife spe speaks English, she has a very pronounced accent. The only way that you can speak a language without an accent is to learn it when you're little, little when the brain is primed for language. Now you can still learn language when you're older, but you're gonna have language with an accent. Well, morality is the same way. There's a time to learn empathy. There's a time to learn morality. And later, when you're older, if you didn't learn when you were little, you can kind of be taught, uh, kind of, uh, be taught uh, this kind of morality and empathy, but you'll always have um, morality with an accent. This is why we have so much problem, uh, so much trouble in the criminal justice system with the revolving door prison of people going into prison and coming out and into prison and coming out. It's because in many respects, uh, some of the people, not all, some of the people who uh, are constant recidivists who go back to prison are people who were improperly socialized, who never really had their moral sense instilled uh, properly when they were little. And when you miss that window of opportunity, uh, it's a lot more work. Um, and that's why, you know, quality, Mead would say, Freud would say, modern psychologists and sociologists would say that quality parenting is uh, very, very important, right? So establishing a sense of empathy is the epitome of the socialization process for Mead. And it's what helps uh, society function. One of the reasons that we believe that the ability to uh, perceive another's mind or look into another person's mind or have empathy 
is an evolved capacity and something that develops over time are interesting experiments that uh, psychologists have done showing how children of a certain age are incapable of peering into the minds of other people or imagining what other people know. But as they get older, they seem to develop the process. And after this lecture, there are two short videos that I have assigned where you can see these fascinating experiments. Okay. This process of role taking also allows the self to develop according to Mead. And Mead divides the self into two parts. Remember, Freud had the id, ego, and superego. And uh, Mead divides the self into what he calls the I and the me. The I is the self as subject, you, going through life, uh, experiencing reality in the first person. That's the I. The me is the self as object. It's how others see you or if you stand outside yourself and examine yourself, if you view yourself as one person among many, uh, as subject, um, that's the me. And, uh, you know, this is developed by entering the minds of other people and seeing yourself through another person's mind. Right? So I can imagine what I, you know, it's hard for people to know what they're like. But one way that I know what I'm like or one way that I understand myself is by seeing myself the way my children see me or sort of looking at myself through my children's eyes or looking at myself through my mother's eyes or looking at myself through my wife's eyes. That is, you know, I am practicing using the me. And again, uh, this is something that can go horribly wrong, right? Uh, if I'm learning how to view myself as an object by entering another person's mind, then it helps if the other person's mind is a welcoming place, right? If my mother neglects me or is mean to me or resents me, if the mind of my mother is a hostile place, I'm not going to enter my mother's mind to look at myself. And I will have, you know, I could very well have some sort of personality disorder where I'm unable to see myself through other people's minds because other people's minds uh, are a scary place to be. The other thing that happens when you view yourself uh, as an object is something that the text calls anticipatory socialization. Anticipatory socialization is the idea that you're moving through life and you occupy certain roles and statuses now in your life, but those will change. Um, we all get older, we all uh, finish school, and we can um, start to think about what it's going to be like to occupy different statuses by entering the minds of people who occupy those statuses. If you are uh, uh, engaged and you tell people, oh, I'm engaged, all kinds of married people will give you unsolicited marital advice about how to be married. They're socializing you. This is anticipatory socialization. Uh, when my wife and I became pregnant with our first child, all kinds of people would give us unsolicited parenting advice, teaching us uh, you know, what it's like to be a parent. Uh, I watch my dad, you know, now he's dead, but I watched my dad get old and I would see my dad at various stages in life and now I see myself at those stages, right? I think about my dad at 50 and I sort of learned how to be 50 by imagining my dad at 50. Uh, I remember shortly before my dad died, uh, the whole family at Christmas time was sitting around going through old photos. And uh, uh, my nephew Scott, the oldest grandchild, uh, pulled out a photo of my dad when he had just been commissioned in the Air Force. 
And at the time, I think Scott was 24, 25 years old. And the photo of my dad looked so much like Scott. It, is, it was as if Scott had gotten in a time machine and gone back and put on that Air Force uniform. I mean, if you looked at Scott and looked at my dad at the same age, they were twins. And Scott looked at the picture and then looked across the room at my 75 year old dad and looked down at the picture again and looked back at my 75 year old dad. And there wasn't a doubt in my mind what he was thinking. He was thinking one day I'm going to be 75 years old, right? If I'm lucky. And this is, you know, one of the most interesting things about humanity and one of the most difficult things about humanity is that human beings know, you know, that you're going to die. You know that you're mortal. You know that death is inevitable. There's nothing you can do about it. Every person that lives must die. And that makes human existence weird and precarious, right? Dogs don't contemplate their mortality. Uh, your dog doesn't like to go to the vet because, but he doesn't like to go to the vet because he doesn't want to get a shot or he doesn't want to have a stranger, you know, touching him or he doesn't want to get a thermometer up his butt. You don't put the dog in the car to take him to the vet and the dog sitting in its carrier going, God, I hope it's not cancer, right? The dog does not have existential anxieties, but you do. Uh, you're afraid. Uh, you're uh, concerned about the unknown, and that's a weird thing about the uh, human condition, uh, mortality. The sociologist Charles Horton Cooley argues that our self is maintained through a process of social interaction. So once the self is established, maintaining it is um, a social act. And he developed a theory that he calls the looking glass self. A theory of how the self is maintained. And it's a three-step process. First, we imagine how we look to others. We imagine how others see us. And we interpret their reactions. And based on their reactions, we develop a self-concept. In other words, uh, we are what we think others think of us. And uh, these reactions, uh, our interpretations may be accurate or they may be not accurate. Uh, let me give you uh, an example from my life of how this works. Uh, when I first started teaching college, it was I was a new graduate student and uh, had the opportunity to teach my first class. And as a graduate student that's low on the totem pole, um, I ended up having to teach a class that started at 730 AM. UNF doesn't even have classes that start that early. So uh, even though I'm not much of a morning person, here I am uh, getting all prepared to teach my 730 class, doing the best I can to prepare to make sure that I'm the best teacher I can possibly be. And I would get up every day uh, and go to school and uh, give these lectures that I had spent hours and hours and hours preparing. And I would look out over the class and see that everybody was asleep. And I mean, dead asleep. I mean, in REM sleep, drooling on their desk asleep. And what I gathered from that was that I was a crappy teacher, uh, that I shouldn't be doing this for a living, that I should quit grad school and do something else. And when I told my advisor, look, you know, I'm a terrible teacher. And, he, you know, he pulled me aside and said, That's it. everybody's asleep. But, you know, the reason you're given that class is because everybody's asleep in that class. Don't take it personally. There's, you know, the world's greatest comedian couldn't keep those kids awake at 730 in the morning. Right. But but that's the idea that you develop a self-concept based on other people's reactions, because we know that other people's reactions will affect our self-concept, for instance. Sometimes we'll ask for a second opinion or we'll sort of fish around to see how we think other people will react before we go out. My wife will sometimes say, so what do you think of this outfit? And she's trying to get my opinion because she knows that how her evening goes will depend on how she feels like other people are reacting. Uh, a lot of times people, you'll hear women particularly say, I'm thinking about cutting my hair. I'm thinking about doing this with my hair. Uh, they want to sort of 
a float a trial balloon out there to see how it might go because once it's done you got to live with it and they want to make sure that they can uh, live with the reactions and we know that different people see us different ways uh, also because we know that other people's reactions affect our self-concept we know that our reactions affect other people's self-concept so sometimes what we do is we mask our reactions uh, my birthday just happened and uh, my children uh, went to the store and bought me presents <laughs> and uh, you know um, a 10 year old and uh, uh, a seven year old are not great at picking out exactly what I want but you can bet that when I opened those presents I had the greatest enthusiasm for them and I let my children know that it, they were their greatest birthday presents ever um, I masked my true reaction uh, which was that the expensive gift that my son bought me was something I would never use and I would really like to take it back. But I'm not going to because uh, I, I don't want to hurt his feelings. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, when he was very little, he would draw me pictures and uh, I would take these pictures and put them on the wall and tell him what beautiful pictures they were. I didn't say to him, oh, what, what the heck is this? This just looks like scribbles. You have no aptitude for art, boy. Uh, so... Uh, not only do we look for other people's reactions to uh, adjust our self-concept, we often, because we know this process is going on, we mask our true reactions. And uh, uh, we attempt to hide the way we really feel to maintain other people's self-concept. And what this means is that in many respects, society is a performance. Society is like a play. And... Uh, you know, uh, uh, when you're uh, when you're on stage in a play, the goal is to make sure that the show goes smoothly. If someone forgets their lines, you cover for them. If someone makes a mistake, you try uh, and uh, keep the show going regardless. So society is uh, performance in many respects. So this is the process of socialization, the process of establishing the self, and the process of maintaining the self. And these are some of the things that I wanted to uh, go over from the reading.